Welcome to Stockholm Hardware. This is number 16, and today it's all about autonomous. Um, so it's uh, packed upstairs. I think uh, there's a um, fairly full... Okay, I'm getting an echo. <laughs> okay, uh, we're live streaming uh, and recording, so uh, if you want to look at this or any uh, other uh, talks that we've had here, you can go to the Stockholm Hardware website and check it out. Um, we're showing a copy of the stream downstairs and also uh, further up the road at Open Lab. So if, if it becomes too full, uh, you can go up there with uh, Mikael. This is Mikael. Um, he'll uh, take you up there if, if, uh, if we need more space. Cool. Um, as you can tell from the uh, number of uh, photos on the slide, there is uh, a lot of, lot of uh, speakers tonight uh, and a lot of really interesting content. Um, the agenda looks uh, pretty standard uh, if you've uh, been here before. Uh, we'll do um, a little bit of introduction, uh, some community announcements, and then we'll move to the first two main speakers. The main speakers are about 15, 20 minutes each. Then we do a break. During the break, there's a makerspace tour in this building, and there's an open lab uh, tour in the other building. There's also uh, some demos of some robotics in the other building, so you may wanna, maybe on your way home, you can stop by there. Um, and then after the break, we'll do uh, the third main speaker, followed by the lightning talks. The lightning talks are um, kind of like quick fire format, max five minutes. And then, of course, uh, we wrap up. Uh, I'll say a few words just about uh, the, the group. Um, so Stockholm Hardware is a group of uh, volunteers, and we are working to uh, enhance and improve the hardware scene in Stockholm. We try to have a broad focus and uh, be very inclusive. So this is really a, a meetup for everybody that are interested in hardware. It's not for hardware people per se. It's for people who are interested in hardware. It's not for profit, it's run by volunteers. We've run for about two years. Uh, we've done 15 meetups. We just did uh, our first workshop last year and we're gonna do another one next month. We'll talk about that in a moment. And as I mentioned, we have all the past uh, presentations on stockholmhardware.se. Yeah, that's the website. That's also the website. Oh, um, through a collaboration, there's also a list of uh, hardware startups if you're interested in the business side of um, hardware. Uh, go to the website and click on hardware startups, I think. Um, so for the remainder of the year, uh, if, in case you want to come back, we are planning to do uh, monthly meetups like this, and then every third month we'll do a hands-on workshop where you get to work with some hardware. Um, there is a collaboration with ID Action that Mikael will talk about in a moment. Um, we have every month, we have a, um, this is a, a new thing this year, we have a, a, a raffle or kind of like a giveaway. I'll uh, just show you. This month, it is a QuirkBot kit. Who knows QuirkBot? Okay, yeah. Okay, so that's maybe 10%. So that's cool because uh, along with the QuirkBot kit comes also, um, cool, comes also a workshop. So it is a QuirkBot workshop. And uh, if you join the Mentimeter survey that we're going to do in a moment, you can put your name in at the end, and then you'll be in the raffle and we'll pick a winner before we go home. Cool. Um, oh, yeah, this is the raffle from last time. This is the raffle this time. So uh, we are actually uh, six co-organizers. And maybe stand up and uh, wave if uh, there's any around. Here's Susanna. Here's Ted. Uh, Laura and Thomas is not here today. Max is maybe downstairs. Uh, if you're interested in uh, talking more about Stockholm Hardware or maybe some of the uh, topics that these people work with, obviously feel free to reach out to them. They're interested in helping out in the community. A uh, bit of logistics. Uh, downstairs, there was some food, and uh, there is as much as there was. The beer, uh, there's more, so that will get refilled if you drink it. There's non-alcoholic beer also. Um, 
As I mentioned, we have three floors, this floor, downstairs, and at Open Lab. Uh, the interesting thing about Open Lab is we've got the robotics demos. Uh, there's tour both places in the break. Bathrooms. Uh, in this building, they're up here on the first level. There's two of them. Uh, thanks to Marek for doing the camera work. Thank you, Marek. Yep, and thanks to Raphael for helping out with everything else. Um, I think I mentioned that we're doing a live stream. Uh, here are the partners. Uh, the new partner is uh, M.NU, uh, which is a place to get um, smart home and kind of consumer electronics prototyping gear. Uh, Things, which is the place that we're at now. Linda's here. I think Linda will come up and say a word uh, in a moment. Uh, Things is a co-working space for hardware startups. So uh, it's a good place if you're into the business side. And then uh, Invest Stockholm is about uh, positioning Stockholm internationally. They're also helping us out. So. Whoops. Okay. Lots of, uh, I'm trying to go through it quickly. As I mentioned, uh, the next uh, event is the hands-on, uh, hands-on robotics workshop. And it will be March 24th. It's already on Meetup, but you have to just follow a link to go to some event site, Confetti, to book uh, and pay for tickets. They're not free. Like these meetups are always free. Their hands-on workshops are f to pay for. Uh, okay, yes, in a moment. And then the next uh, meetup will be in April, and it will be on this fairly broad theme of diversity. Um, we actually would love to take uh, your suggestions for uh, speakers. So if you have some suggestions, please post them on Facebook, Twitter, or on the Meetup group. Okay, so uh, Carl, do you want to maybe come and talk a little bit about the um, QuirkBot workshop? Sure, yep. you're up here. Hey guys. Uh, well, it's gonna be an interesting night. I've been uh, on paternity leave for six months and I just got back, so I figured I'll just throw myself into a networking startup event and see how it goes. <laughs> um, but um, uh, 24th of March, uh, there's gonna be a really fun and engaging robot race workshop uh, that I decided to call the emotional robot race. Uh, and soon I perhaps already just go into the event uh, page. Oh, yeah, yeah, so just... Uh, so it's actually, I it's for, uh, you can buy single tickets, you can go uh, alone and meet other uh, playful nerds, uh, or you could um, bring a friend, or you could bring your kid. Uh, so it's it's for kids of all ages, really. Just You just have to have a kid-like uh, mindset. So uh, QuirkBot is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's an educational robot kit. Um, where we focus on fun and play and creative exploration of technology. Uh, but also, I don't know. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there should be no sound on the event. Uh huh, okay. Ah, okay. Got it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, don't worry. So, um, there will be angry robots, sad robots, and shy robots that just want to go home. Whatever you can imagine can happen. We invite you to participate in this highly engaging, playful, and very emotional experience, at least for the robots. Uh, may the most emotional robot win. So uh, I've been doing for the last couple of years a uh, workshop format called Robot Race, where you basically just build from drinking straws and electronics. Um, you don't have to program from the beginning. They come pre-programmed, these little quirk butts. Um, and then you just explore how your robot sort of uh, moves. Uh, and um, you know, and then you race. But then uh, in this workshop, you also have to add like a personality to uh, uh, sort of display if, if your robot is angry or what kind of motion it has. Uh, and this kit is perfect for for doing those kinds of playful explorations. So without uh, me talking too much, uh, you can go. Well, the link is in the hardware meetup, uh, right? So uh, and. Um, I'm just gonna end with showing this 50 second video uh, that explains a little bit more uh, what you can do with the kit that Suna just uh, showed. So, uh, yeah. Do you want sound? Uh, well, it adds, it adds to the feeling, but it's not. 
super necessary. <laughs> Also, if you're an engaged parent that care about your kid's education, uh, about 70% of our turnover is to, uh, is to schools and education. So you should come and you should convince your teacher to buy a kit also. Thanks. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Carl. Um, yeah, so that's the uh, that'll be the event for next month. So it's a hands-on workshop, and the prizes are there's some hardware promo code, and it's between three hundred and fifty and eight hundred and fifty. Um, Linda, yep. do you want to come and talk uh, briefly about uh, things? So things is this space that we're in, and uh, Linda has helped us uh, since we did the very first event. So thanks, Linda. Thanks a lot, Sune. Well, this is some, well, actually one of the most fun things we do here. Uh, so Things is a place. Uh, we have the full house here. We got almost 2,000 th two square meters. It's um, it, it's a co-working space for uh, for the real nerds, to be frank. Um, and we do a lot of activities as well. Uh, we get currently about 45 member companies seated here, about 140 people who are super techy, uh, about the same number of alumni and We've got roughly 200, 300 people or companies in our um, kind of prospect group that we try to get in touch with sometimes too, to uh, come with uh, great financing ideas or partnering up with people and so on. Uh, great to have you guys here. I won't probably won't stay all night, uh, but just feel free if you feel I have a company that you think would fit in, uh, email me, linda at things.com.com. Very easy. Enjoy. Okay, cool. Um, so moving on from background to uh, what it's about tonight. Um, if anyone would like to share something with the community, we have a little segment called Community Announcements. You get a minute on stage to talk about what you're up to uh, or you know, if, if you think the community will be interested. So if you want, uh, you can come up and uh, line up over here. Uh, there's a few that we already have on the line. Um, Mikhail, Hannes, and Antonio. You're eager. You, you, you can come in to go first. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see if we can find. Whoop, whoop. Here we go. Welcome, Antonio. Hello, I am Antonio. I am Italian, and you can see my accent. So I am the co-founder of this place. It's called Exosphere. One minute, only one minute. So it's uh, a, an academy where basically crazy people, crazy scientists from all over the world are gathering, and they will spend six weeks full time in uh, working in a developing project related to technology, emerging and exponential technology, and also this is what we call the science, the science part, and working also in what we call the art part, which is also going deep in the human nature and trying to mix the understanding not only of the technology but also the, about the impact of the you know the human soul as in this kind of environment. And basically are six weeks where people from all over the world, from any background, from any age, are gathering. And we are doing, we have done this in South America, in Chile, and in Brazil. We just come here in Europe. We are going to run one in Italy, one in Stockholm, and one in Kiev. In Stockholm is going to be done in the epicenter in uh, July and August. If you can go on the website, it's exosfeed.re, and then we will get all the information. Thank you. Uh, Michael, you want to go? Yeah. It's yeah. so, uh, Michael from T Toolspace. Hi, and today I'm from ID Action, oh, yeah. actually. Uh, so, do you have the slides? Yeah. yeah. 
So we are running a 12-week program, uh, totally free for hardware entrepreneurs. Yeah, uh, for hardware, hardware entrepreneurs. Uh, it's totally free, 12 weeks. And what you get is a lot of uh, insights through our partners. So we are partnering with uh, OpenLab, for example, doing design thinking workshops. Uh, we're partnering with uh, Startup Stockholm, business development, and also Toolspace, which I also is. So there is a, a workshop that you can access during the program. And it's early hardware ideas, any type of idea when, for example, if you're working at a company and you have something that you see is not working at the company, you can come and apply to the program. Uh, and if you're a private person and you have a life hack that you want to test if it's valid and you can find customers for it, you can apply to the program. And today it's, it's running through 2018. Uh, we have eight participants right now. We're going to have nine in one and a half week. It's Frederick is here, I think also uh, a participant in the program. Uh, and what we want from you also is, these people have ideas, but they also have challenges. Uh, so they're, they're going to come here in the future and do these uh, one minute announcements and reaching out to you. So if you have special skills, knowledges, please share with these people, will, uh, with the participants in the program. So ID Action Program, apply also if you have ideas. So great. Cheers to JB is uh, up at uh, Open Lab uh, and doing a tour of uh, some of their space up there. I'm going to try to Skype him in in a moment, but um, I'm, I'm not quite feeling courageous yet right now, so I'm just going to give it another second. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I was gonna, just going to say on behalf of uh, Lena, she uh, bailed out last minute. Um, so I, I promised to mention that there is uh, an event uh, coming up in Shista in April which is all about um, Swedish or Scandinavian uh, electronics manufacturing. Uh, I think uh, the most interesting thing for me, apart from electronic space, is Swedish championship in hand soldering. <laughs> it's free to attend. So uh, that's obviously worth checking out. There's like real, real like actual useful stuff too, I think, but uh, that uh, I would actually really like to see that. Mm, okay, uh, I think Vitaly dropped out. Uh, Hannes? Hannes? No. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, anyone else? Yes, please come on up. You are, I, I won't do the intro for you, you're going to have to do it yourself. Thank you very much. My name is Simon and I work as the head of content at a podcast called The Business Podden. And it's the biggest podcast in Sweden uh, regarding business and uh, economics. Each week, we're guested by a billionaire or someone who founded a company with, uh, that has a billionaire, uh, like a billion turnover. And uh, we listen to pitches, three pitches each uh, week that comes from our listeners. And it's a 90 second pitch. And right now, I'm here looking for anyone who has a startup or a small company uh, who would like to apply to pitch. Uh, tomorrow we're having a, a recording with Brent Lexel, who started uh, the company Elekta. And um, um, yeah, so come talk to me if you want. We're having an event with 3,000 persons at uh, uh, an exit here in Sweden, where we'll have the finale of the pitches. So come talk to me. I'll sitting, I'm, busy. I'm sitting here in the front. Thank you. Perfect timing, literally one minute. Okay, so um, the last thing on the agenda before um, actually getting on with the main talks is uh, get some uh, audience feedback. So um, pretty please, this is your chance to pull out your mobile device. Go to this uh, URL in the top, menti.com, and type in those six digits. Then we have, uh, I think, five questions, all uh, straightforward and all meant to both give us some feedback, but also give, get you a sense of who else is in the community around you. Uh, of course, I'm looking direct on the people on the first floor over here, but if you're in, in, the, in the lounge or in an open lab, or you're uh, watching the live stream, then please uh, jump on in. Um, this is really important to us. Uh, we really use this uh, feedback to help us decide how to um, plan and arrange our uh, future meetups. So pretty please make sure to get in there and give your feedback and uh, keep your phone open because there'll be another four questions or so. 
as I mentioned, at the end of these, you'll be able to put in your name if you like, and then you'll be in competition for the QuirkBot workshop. One ticket. Okay, I'm thinking that we should uh, maybe uh, hold on this slide until maybe it says like 150 or something. What do you think? No, it could, could be that we're waiting for a long time then. Okay, cool. So um, this is pretty common actually. Uh, generally about half of the people who come here uh, come for the first time, even though we've done maybe 15, 18 uh, meet uh, workshop uh, meetups. And then there are the hardcores. How many hardcore 10 plus? Oh man, that's, that's intense, hardcore. Okay, cool, we are at 130. Uh, just wanted to make sure to encourage you to really give this feedback. There's a few more questions. Um, this one, just to give us a quick indication of where, where people ended up. Uh, that should be very simple. And the next one may be like a little bit more fun. Huh? Oh, sorry, uh, the one, the, the, the place that I'm at <laughs> is the Things event space. The uh, downstairs where you uh, may have picked up a beer and a sandwich was the Things Lounge. Open Lab is where you may have some uh, robots driving around. And if you don't have it yet, it'll be coming soon. Okay, interesting. Um, skip that. Uh, what's your day job and activity? Uh, this is to give all of you a sense of um, the breadth or diversity or like different types of backgrounds that people have in here. Um, so once you start putting that in, it should just like throws fl th flow through this screen and it makes for interesting reading. I recently joined uh, Volvo Cars Mobility, as you may know, and uh, Linda, my colleague, is here. She wrote recruiting. Where are you, Linda? Good idea. Um, whoever is sitting next to the windows, if you could uh, open them up, and then there's like there's a little hatch that you can plug on there so it doesn't close again. Uh, if you're back at the end, yes, perfect, yeah. Um, I always find it uh, fun and fascinating to look through uh, this list uh, that talks about uh, the different perspectives to look at the hardware from. Awesome. Okay, who's doing FPGA? Okay, not, so whoever's doing FPGA, uh, I, there was a few FPGA people here last night when I was here setting up. Um, and I guess you're maybe downstairs or you're at Open Lab, but you should take a moment to explain to the people next to you what FPGA is. Because that's what I asked last night. I was like, what is this FPGA stuff? This is a common question. They're random. Okay, um, this is maybe almost uh, too early since you haven't really been here that long and maybe the most annoying thing so far is that we haven't started with the talks yet. Uh, but I'm going to leave this one up so uh, you can put in some comments, uh, both, you know, things that you liked, great, things that you think could be better, really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to uh, leave it up there um, so that you can, uh, I mean, we're going to leave it on your phone. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I know. Okay, so if there's somebody who would like to volunteer doing some design work, and Ted, I'm looking at you. <laughs> okay, cool. That's great. I'm thinking that could be you. Um, so next time it'll probably be in Keynote. Isn't that right, Ted? Okay. So uh, I'll leave this up so you can uh, give some feedback. And then meanwhile, we're going to jump over and get started with our talks. Uh, we have two main talks, then we take a break. Third main talk and lightning talks. So it's going to be awesome. Um, Please welcome Laura and Krista.
Should we do 15 plus your name? Is that what it says? I think so. Let's do 15 minutes plus your name. Yes, here we are. Let's see if it. Okay. 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 Can you hear me? I think so, right? Yes. Thank you, Suna, for the introduction. I'm the second Italian here standing in the stage. <laughs> I'm uh, Laura, and, and I'm here today with Christopher to talk a little bit about, about uh, Scania's road towards autonomous transport solutions. But before beginning with the talk, we would like to tell you a little bit more about ourselves. And um, yes, as I said before, I'm Italian. I did my studies uh, in control engineering. And then after my master, I moved to France. And then I did my PhD there. After defending my PhD, I moved to Sweden. And I start working as a developer at Scania in uh, pre-development and uh, advanced engineer. And since then, I've been working with autonomous transport solutions. Do you want to say something about yourself, Christopher? Thank you. So, my name is Christopher. I'm not as uh, exotic as Laura. I'm from Dalekalia or Dalarna, here in Sweden, a bit up north. Uh, I studied in Linköping, applied physics and electrical engineering for five years and got the opportunity to do a summer job and a thesis, a master thesis at Scania. And there I got stuck. So now I've been working for a couple of years with uh, advanced driver assistance systems. And recently I did a switch internally at Scania to pre-development to autonomous transport solutions. So tonight you will hear a bit more about this. Yes. Perfect intro to me. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. Just wanted to say, yep. uh, as you maybe feel, it's it's crowded up here and it's really crowded downstairs, and uh, the people downstairs can't really get in. So I think it would be great, uh, Mikael, if you could uh, take uh, 20 or 30 people and uh, bring them over to uh, Open Lab. That would be awesome. Um, you'll be able to watch uh, both the live stream, of course, the second live stream, and then if it uh, when it clears up here, then uh, come back and uh, do the tour here afterwards. Cool, just to make sure that the people downstairs, like, gra grab a beer and a sandwich and uh, walk with uh, Mikael. He'll come down and pick you up. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. I'll give you extra time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Don't worry. So, thank you. So, what we've seen at Scania, uh, we have identified a few new focus areas which are very important, which are the connected part, the electrified, and the autonomous. So Scania is spending a lot of resources all the way from research to product development to create services, products, and, and transport solutions. But today we will talk a bit more about this autonomous part. And to give you the, the background to why we're even doing this, we're going back to our core values. Because we always think about the customer first. If it's not beneficial for the customer, then we shouldn't do it. So we try to involve the customer in an early stage to adapt the solution for the customer need and iterate until we make something amazing. Respect for the individual, everyone gets to speak up. Everyone is respected. At our section, we have 16 different nationalities. So we have experts from the entire globe, which is really amazing. Elimination of waste. We always should try to identify what's not necessary. And if it's not necessary, then we should stop doing it. Determination. We are very determined at Scania. When we get a fine product, we should never be satisfied. 
we should always try to get to the next step. Always try to challenge ourselves, do something better. And integrity, I mean, sustainable transport solutions is the, is the final goal. Team spirit, we are now part of this Volkswagen group. So we are working closely together with, for instance, MAN, and we're trying to take this next step together. And to look a bit about automation from a customer perspective. You can see that fuel is a big part of the cost, operating costs for a customer during the first four years of operation. Salary is a big cost as well, also close to 30%. Taxes, insurances, 10%. And you have maintenance and service, 7%. So if we can deliver a fuel efficient system which helps the customer to drive the vehicles in an efficient way, we can reduce the fuel. An active safety system can increase, increase the safety and reduce the cost for maintenance and repair. And probably also lower the costs for taxes and insurances. And if we go for the full automation step, we can probably lower the cost for the salary as well. But this will not be an overnight change. We will need a driver for a very long time. But uh, the driving task might change during yeah, the upcoming years. Yes? This is the, the cost for a customer. So a fleet, say for instance, at the Yona fleet. This is the distribution of money during the first four years of operation, if you have a truck, for instance, and drive long haulage. Yes. And a short ADAS, or Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, which are partly step to fully autonomous vehicles. And one definition is advanced driver assistance systems represent a wide range of systems that is designed to help the driving, making the driver process safer and more efficient. And one of the systems that we have provided at Scania is this autonomous emergency braking system, which has been legislated since 2015. So this will reduce uh, rear-end collisions due to inattentive drivers. And it's designed by using two sensors, which is a camera and a radar provided uh, that provides information about the surrounding. And the sensor fusion is made in-house, developed in-house by Scania and also the AEB functionality, which can provide a collision warning so if there is an imminent risk of collision, we'll provide a warning to the driver and hopefully the driver will take full control of the situation. If it's not the case, then we'll provide a warning break. Come on, wake up, take control. I, and if that's not the case, we will initiate a full break in order to stop behind this vehicle ahead of us and stop as close as possible to make, make space for the vehicles behind us to stop, to, to increase their opportunity to stop, to stop behind us. And imagine now you're away with your friends to the neighboring city. You bought some ice cream, you're heading up to the car, going back home to your city again. You head up to the highway and uh, you have a look in the rear mirror and you see that uh, you, your friend is a bit fumbly and you end up in a traffic jam, you stop. And you see that your friend, the friend of yours, drops his ice cream down to the back seat. So when you are at standstill, you turn over, you look in the rear mirror, and this is what you see. And I mean, this is the system that I got to test or to develop the first thing I when I started at Scania. I got a driver license and yeah, they said to me, set the cruise control at the highest available speed 
and drive towards this balloon car. And I mean, it's very strange feeling to drive towards something at high speed. Myself, I would have braked much, much earlier. But it was a thrilling experience. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. So let's continue our journey towards autonomous transport solutions. And at Scania, we always put our autonomous transports into a context. For example, a mine for industrial operations or uh, roads and highways for long haulage applications. And finally, the city, when uh, we want to deal with public transports uh, and distribution tasks. But what are autonomous transports if we don't have a way to control them? And that's why at Scania we develop our intelligent control environment that dispatches high-level tasks and distribute them to the our autonomous fleet. So as a first step into autonomy, environments like this one, very well controlled uh, and uh, with a low interaction with human areas like a mine, are the perfect pr playground for us to build up our knowledge and to bring it to the next level, maybe in the highways or in the cities. But operations like that are also very important because we can bring value to a mine and uh, automating operations that are very uh, hard and maybe dangerous and, uh, and dirty for humans. And here we can see a fleet of vehicles that receive orders from a control tower. As we develop our technologies, we also are better and better in developing sensors, collecting data, and uh, taking out good information that we can use for our algorithms. And here we can see a few pictures of our autonomous trucks, starting from the second generation on top, the third generation autonomous trucks. And then here we have a visionary picture of what a mining vehicle will look like in 10 or 20 years from now. But let's move on to the highways. Platooning. Scania started developing platooning in 2009. What is platooning? It's a way of driving in a formation. So trucks standing uh, close behind one another, keeping a control distance in order to increase efficiency and to optimize the traffic flow, as cyclists might do when they run a race. Currently, Scania is uh, uh, developing uh, platooning and test it in uh, Singapore. And uh, we are driving nine kilometers from one port to the other with a platoon consisting of a lead vehicle, which is uh, manned and uh, with the driver, and the following vehicles are fully automated. Yes? How many units can you have? You can have three or four units. Yes, how many units, how many vehicles are in a platoon? So we had three and four. Christopher might know a little bit more about that. Have we ever made uh, a platoon with more than four vehicles? Of course, oh okay, yeah, you can, you can reply to this. Yes, I mean, there is no limitation for it. It can be, the, the road itself can have a limitation, like, and I mean, this is negotiable. We need to have a way to, uh, to make this into the public. I mean, how would we like to react when we see a platoon on the highway? How, how do we, we need to get off to the entrance or to the exit? Yeah, yeah sure. And even more. Yes, but uh, let's have a look of uh, how a platoon looks like. When we first began uh, in around 2010 driving with uh, platooning, we only drove with longitudinal control and today we have a technique that allows us to even let go of the steering wheel and let the truck steer by itself. I was driving as the third or the fourth truck 
and it was a great experience. It was very relaxing, giving control to the system, being able to follow four vehicles in a platoon without having to do anything. And finally, yes, this slide, this slide in this picture is my favorite one because it brings me back so much memories So since when I started at Scania. And uh, Christopher and I have spent so many hours in this bus driving and testing our software. So two years ago, Scania presented uh, its first autonomous bus line in Södertälje test track. And uh, what we want to do in, in the future is to bring this autonomous line into a real city and make our autonomous vehicle interact with people, cars, and maybe other autonomous vehicles. And uh, yes, now we want to show some, uh, uh, some images about uh, our uh, prototype research vehicles and how they operate in Scania's test truck. The future transport system will reap the full benefit of connected vehicles. Vehicles will need to adapt their behavior to each other in order to fulfill their common transport tasks and optimize the flow of goods or people within the transport system. In many situations, the vehicles will be driven autonomously, increasing safety and fuel efficiency. Does this sound like a distant scenario? It's not. The journey has already begun and Scania is well prepared to take on the challenge. Scania has been conducting research within autonomous transport systems for almost a decade. Today, research prototype vehicles are driving along the streets of Scania's test track in Södertälje, carrying out transport tasks sent to vehicles from a transport management system. Every action is analyzed for optimization of the overall transport flow. In the control room, the operators manage the overall flow and monitor the overall performance of the transport system. While operating, the vehicles are in fact cooperating, following the other vehicles and awaiting their actions when necessary. They also interact with manually driven vehicles, giving way before resuming their tasks. An autonomous vehicle detects the wheel loader and predicts its movement, thus making the decision to stop. The truck is following the road, scanning its surface to determine where to drive. In the open area, vehicles freely choose the best route to their destination, avoiding any obstacles. At its loading point, the vehicle signals to the manually driven wheel loader that it's ready to take on load. The entire transport task, including driving and unloading the goods, is then carried out completely automatically. Vehicles sometimes operate in environments that are remote, dangerous or unhealthy for human workers. Autonomous vehicles can work in all conditions and take people out of harm's way. An example is within mining operations, where conditions can be made not only safer, but more efficient and profitable. In some applications, the driver will remain in the driver's seat for a long time to come. In these cases, the vehicle often drives autonomously, but hands over to the driver in other situations. While the driver is in control, the vehicle will still offer extensive support. For example, identifying obstacles and preventing accidents where the driver might not notice the danger. Each autonomous transport solution is unique, modular and individually tailored to individual operator needs. minutes to autopilot deactivation. Scania's transport solutions optimize flow and minimize waste, creating value for the customer and reducing the environmental impact of heavy road transport. Autonomous transport systems open the door to a world of opportunities. Scania has set the course toward the destination, the sustainable transport system 
of the future. And I would just like to wrap it up and show you how the future might look like. And I will go for the final slide directly. This is a visionary image of a connected city. It's electrified and it's autonomous. So mobility might be provided as a service. You might have an app, you might have a contract, contract deal for your transport needs. So whenever you like to go somewhere, you just notify the system and you will be notified when it's time for you to leave. So it can be carried out by bigger transport ports and smaller ones for the first and last mile transport. So to sum up, this is a really interesting area and we are really happy to be here today. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Yes, two minutes questions. Yes? Yes, um, yes, of course. So the question was whether we have uh, considered if Ascania should, how it should act when it meets another brand out on the streets. So for instance, we are involved in different uh, projects or uh, collaborations with different companies. Say for instance, European Truck Platooning Challenge, where we're driving together with MN, Volvo, Mercedes, for instance. So yes, we are involved and we, we really need to be involved. Do we have another question? Yes? That's a very good question. So this system is designed to mitigate collisions. So during great conditions, it can avoid all uh, collisions for static obstacles. I will not say all. But uh, for instance, it uh, assumes a certain road friction and will try to break in an earlier stage compared to this road friction. So it will, in most cases, during good conditions, just be able to ease up the brakes. But uh, sometimes you get some obstacle in close from, from the side. And this system is, uh, uh, contains a limitation. It needs to provide a collision warning 1.4 seconds before actually starting to break, which in some cases, yeah, means that uh, the driver needs to react before this, this time period. Yes. So the young kind of that most trucks are called either to individual drivers or to small companies. So uh, how, how do you how do you manage the uh, long term economy vision of yeah working against people's jobs and stuff like that? What's what's your what's your take there? <laughs> so once more, please. I. Uh, so I think that we can uh, create new possibilities for the drivers. Say for instance that you have a system that makes you be able to drive in cer uh, under circumstan circumstances, say for instance highway or another application. So during your time on the highway you can now uh, do other tasks. You can complete other job related tasks if we can carry out the driving and you can set this, uh, uh, this uh, what is it called? This uh, that notifies your speed and your working hours and the travel distance, which means that you can do other stuff in the meanwhile. Yes? Okay. Thank you.
Sorry to uh, interrupt. Uh, as uh, as uh, we talked about earlier, there's really a ton of content and uh, we have a lot to get through. Um, of course, uh, part of being here is to uh, talk to each other. So I encourage you to go see uh, Laura and Chris during the break. Uh, whether you're upstairs, downstairs, or if you're at uh, Open Lab, then uh, come by uh, on your way back. Sorry to cut off uh, some of the questions. Okay. Um, I I think uh, we're going to do Ingel in just a second, but before we do, I promised um, I promised uh, JB that I would give him a call, and um, I'm curious to check if anyone thinks that this is going to work out. So I'm going to call uh, JB over at Open Lab, and we're going to have a chat. Let's see. Uh -huh. I'm hoping that he'll show us the um, <laughs> robots. JB. JB. Yes. Ah, sweet. Okay, cool. Uh, oh, there's Mikhail, I think. So this is uh, Open Lab, which is uh, further down the street on uh, on the KTH campus. And uh, I thought uh, we could just uh, say hello, maybe uh, give them a quick uh, wave. Thanks, everybody. Okay. And uh, thanks, Mika. You can wave as well. Okay. Um, and maybe uh, you could say hello, JB. Uh, show your face. And uh, if the, if you do have some robotics over there, I'd love to see it. Great. So yeah, just my introduction about about me talking to you now. Uh, yeah, good. So we can see. Yeah, there is 15, 15 seconds difference between what I recall now and what it's on the on here, so that's going to be a little bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I can show you, here we got uh, uh, Electrolyx' latest vacuum cleaner. And Peter is going to have a talk, I guess, uh, later on. So here we go. Here's the crowd. And here we've got, uh, maybe he will do the explanation himself. Yes. So yeah. you can come here and yeah. come here and we'll speak. Yeah. Oh, I need my phone, sorry. Um, so I'm Per Sherboy. I'm showing some module. Are we? Almost. It was so good, you got used to it. You thought, oh, yeah, obviously it's going to work, yeah. And then it didn't. So, everyone to test out and play with. So come down when the talk show over. I'll be here until they throw me out. <laughs> Is it anything you can yeah. show now, maybe quickly? So this this uh, crawler. You should really have it on the floor, but it's easy to show. We also have other. I think it's good. Yeah, perfect. So, ah. so good. Can say goodbye. <laughs> we listen to you here. Thanks, JB. Go ahead. So, um, this is uh, if you are traveling by public transport, uh, Open Lab is uh, on the way to the subway. So, um, you should uh, stop by on the way back. Uh, JB or Mikael will give you a tour of uh, Open Lab if you're interested uh, as well. So uh, thanks a lot, JB. Bye bye. Wait, wait. Uh, Susan is going to say just a quick word about Open Lab also. Oh, right, okay. So you can just go ahead. Hi. Okay, this is what it is. Hello. <laughs> yeah, please do uh, okay, hi, hi, hi. Uh, my name is Susan and I work at Open Lab. Um, so, what is Open Lab? Here we have several functions, so to speak. We give education to master students at Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, we give education about design thinking. Uh, if you know that method, it's a working method, super efficient, and we use it to solve um, society challenge as well, so, on other projects. Um, we are also a co-working space, and we also have a conference center that you can see here. Like this big room? Here? Yeah, and we have like other rooms, um, smaller, different sizes. 
um, what else is to say? We organize regular events, um, mingle and sharing events. This is also good to meet people here, see who does what, you know, regular. Um, what else? There is so much to see. So I think the best way is actually to go on the website because there's so many categories. end to the conversation okay well why don't we why don't we wave goodbye bye JB bye. <laughs> okay that uh, worked out so and so maybe as could be expected um, Ingel yes. come on up please welcome Ingel from universes universes I'm Ingrid from Universes. <laughs> do you have a uh, clicker or? No, sorry. I do it this person does, but I, I don't. So how do you? Is it something? Yeah, great. So hello. I will talk a little bit about who Universes are and who I am, sorry and also sort of what we do and how that relates to autonomous. So I'm very happy that Suna said that this is not only for hardware people, because we're not, we're software people, uh, but we do the components that kind of enable autonomous hardware. So in brief, <coughs> so Universes is a team of uh, top tier computer vision deep learning and robotics scientists and engineers. As you can see, we have quite a high percentage of PhDs, uh, which is really useful because in this area of computer vision, there's very little or no sort of development without research. So it's basically research and development for everything. So our PhDs are luckily very good at embedded development and the, well, master graduates are also sort of versed in research. Um, and then, there's me, I'm the only non-techie person, so it's sort of less relevant for the area. Um, so basically, coming back to autonomous, just kind of making an extremely simplified view of uh, what we do, is basically if you start to the far right, you have some kind of input data first, and then you have sensor hardware, right? And what you want to get out from that sensor hardware is uh, instructions to autonomous hardware, for example, which is why we're here, uh, or some kind of API or interface to software, or interface to a user, right? And in the middle, the scene understanding stuff, that's where you kind of have to make sense of all the input that you get from the sensor hardware, which is basically uh, ones and zeros and pixels and stuff. And that's where we come in. So we do sort of the sensing stuff, uh, which implies uh, sense-specific filtering. If you want to have different data from different sensors and filter out others, uh, you might have image processing, which is basically looking at the pictures and improving the quality of images. Um, you have object classification, which is basically clustering pixels into objects that you can then classify and track. Um, and then you have is basically what you you kind of reconstruct or generate uh, texture and uh, sort of a 3D um, understanding of the input. And then you have sensor fusion because normally in autonomous hardware, especially if you go for vehicles, you'd have a bunch of different sensors. You can have different sensors of the same type like uh, stereo cameras uh, or you can have uh, radars and lidars and complementary sensor types. And these will always generate a bit different types of data, so you need to kind of fusion uh, uh, the inputs and, and normalize it so that you get sort of one coherent understanding of the, the world. Um, you want to localize yourself and build a map so that you understand where you are in relation to different objects that you've identified. Uh, and you also want to know sort of how are you moving uh, in the world around you? And then for autonomous vehicles, you also have the free space detection, which is, which is basically understanding where can the vehicle go given the, uh, the map around it. 
Um, and since we're talking about uh, this part, you also kind of have a decision-making layer that instructs uh, the the hardware and activates it based on on the sort of intelligence that you or the um, interpretation that you get from the sensory data. So again, this is very simplified, but let me know if I'm moving too fast or anything. Um, so that's how we relate to autonomous. Uh, so here's an example how computer vision and deep learning enable robotic automation of sort of non-trivial tasks. And then an interesting example would be if you have an autonomous robot that's supposed to, to uh, it has a task that can vary and in the sense that you cannot program its movements in advance. It will have to adjust according to the situation. And some examples could be a robot that's supposed to grip stuff and it has to adjust the grip, like the angle and how hard it grips and to the weight, the volume and the position of the object. Uh, it can be packaging, if you, if you have, for example, in uh, grocery stores or something, or, or any types of uh, sort of packaging uh, or transformation through packaging or post office or whatever. You have different types of objects that you want to pack in optimal ways. Then you also need to understand what types of objects are you dealing with and how can you optimize the packing for them. Same with sorting, navigating. Uh, monitoring, refilling, etc. So it's basically when when the task at hand for the robot or the motion the robot is supposed to do uh, differs depending on the situation. Then you need computer vision and deep learning for the overall understanding of the scene, i.e. what is happening here. Um, the object identification, classification and tracking, basically what are the stuff that I'm supposed to be handling. Uh, localization and mapping is basically where are they and where am I and sort of how do I extend my robotic arm or um, pick it up or, and do whatever. Um, and also sort of depending on the situation, interpreting your own tasks. So if you have a gripping robot, your task is to grip. But if you have a more complex task at hand, sort of refilling shelves at store or something, you kind of have to interpret, first of all, you know, is this shelf clear? Uh, do I need to refill it and what should I refill it with? So for all of that, you kind of have to have an intelligent interpretation of the scene that you're facing. Um, so we do that a lot. Um, also, another example is in autonomous vehicles. This is what we do primarily. Our largest customer makes autonomous cars. Um, and there we have a SLAM solution um, that enables, well, it stands for simultaneous localization and mapping, which basically enables a vehicle to understand its own position and build a local map of the environment without using external sensors like GPS and stuff. And as you see on this car, it's just an example, uh, but you have a bunch of different sensors because you need to have what you call redundancy. You cannot be reliant on external data flow because what if you get shut off from the GPS? The car, the truck, or whatever you're riding in has to be able to function on its own. That's also why you have a lot of different types of sensor because in different environments and in different situations, the sensor data is complementary. So you mentioned in mines, for example, then you might want to use LiDAR because it's, uh, it's normally very dirty and can be quite difficult to see, also for humans. Um, and in mines, for example, they're trying to, so I know Bo Lidin is trying to automate a lot of their mines, so their ambition is not to be able to, or not to need to use lights and down in the mines because everything is autonomous. Then you can't be reliant on RGB cameras because the RGB cameras uh, look at lights. Um, so, and basically, so the simultaneous localization and mapping is basically, if you look at the small um, icons down there, you have the sensor, you have a map, and you have your own position, right? So localization implies that you have a map and you have your sensor and you determine where you are. It's basically like when you walk around with your mobile phone and follow yourself on Google Maps. Um, if you have mapping, then you have sort of, you know where you are and then you sort of, you interpret the environment in order to build a map. But if you don't know where you are and, and you don't have a map, you need to kind of accumulate that yourself. And that's SLAM, so basically you you use the sensor to make the map and your positioning in real time, which is pretty complex, but it's also 
really important to be able to rely on autonomous vehicles under all conditions. Um, but basically, uh, if you looked like on the first slide I had with a sort of very simplified ecosystem, um, I'll just sort of introduce briefly how, how that's very simplified. And I used the example of autonomous vehicles since that seems to be sort of uh, a common theme of interest for us all. Um, this is a, a, a picture I found, sorry. This is a picture I found on the web, uh, which is uh, just this Comet Labs interpretation of uh, the, uh, the future of transportation stacks. So as you can see, this is not really uh, the traditional value chain uh, that you're normally seen in terms of vehicles and stuff. This is a huge ecosystem. So I'll try to break it down and just sort of talk through how, how the different layers interact because this is an exciting future and it's kind of, it's kind of growing on us right now because it's not really fixed yet. So basically, this is what it says in the, in the far right of the pictures. You have basically a lot of different roles or a lot of different functions uh, which will have a lot of different types of actors in it, but this is all to enable autonomous for vehicles. Um, so if you start very basically, we have the sensors at the very bottom, and this is basically the stuff that kind of uh, drags in data from the environment, right? So the stuff at the far right on my first slide. So that can be, oh, now it's really hard to see what it says, but it says ra radar, LIDAR, vision camera, and then it says something else. I can't really see either. Oh, GPS, I think. And that's one type of actor. That's hardware normally. Then you have... What does it say? Intelligent manufacturing. And that's another different type of animal, right? And then on top of that, you will have the infrastructure <laughs> and the connected cars. And then on top of that, you have the autonomous sort of um, system that kind of inputs to the car, actually the, the autonomy. And I guess you will talk a bit about the restraints on that or uh, later. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then you have, shit, this is really small. <laughs> then you have in-car intelligence and assistance. Then you have the safety and security, uh, the services on top, like Uber and stuff. Uh, and then you have specialty vehicles. And so you see, there's uh, so many different types of roles, and I think computer vision is primarily interesting here, or it's super important here. Uh, so it's basically for the mapping, simulation, and annotation, so understanding the reality in terms of the autonomy. Um, and it's also the navigation assistant uh, stuff, uh, in terms of intelligence in the car and driver assistance. And then you have a lot of other sort of uh, application areas which will be reliant on computer vision, but will maybe where computer vision specialists will be sort of sub-suppliers. Um, so to summarize, maybe uh, simplify it a bit based on that very, very complex uh, pictures, but basically for autonomous and for computer vision's role in it, I think first of all, as you saw, it's an extremely complex ecosystem with a lot of different actors with a lot of different roles that we haven't seen yet. It's also really dynamic. And last but not least, it's like the practicable roles are largely to be defined. And by that, I mean that we don't really know exactly right now, you know, which part of the ecosystems might viably be filled by the same type of actors. So you saw one sort of slicing of the cake, but how the cake will ultimately be sliced is sort of to be determined. So it's, it's a very exciting environment. And um, yeah, I think I'm almost done. As well. So, if you have any questions on sort of the software part of it, yeah. So the question was if we were based on a open and proprietary hardware stack, right? Yeah. No. So we we are hardware agnostic. Uh, with the company that does autonomous cars, we use the sensor hardware that they have selected, um, but we develop everything in house in terms of software. Software. Sp software is proprietary, yes. Except for that particular customer who actually owns the IP. But we develop everything. We don't use, uh, uh, we don't use open source, or we don't use third-party software. 
And uh, speaking of, we were discussing a bit before about, you know, w how how eager would you be on trusting the uh, the actually autonomous car uh, as compared to yourself or a driver? Our customer is actually currently uh, piloting their autonomous cars in Gothenburg, uh, and they have the CEO of the company <laughs> test not driving but test going in the car, which is pretty cool. So yeah, I guess they trust it a, a lot. Other questions? Yeah. So, except for autonomous vehicles? Right. Uh, so, the question was a specific example in which the SLAM technology uh, has uh, given advantages over other types of solutions. So, for example, in, in VR, um, have you tried perhaps like HTC Vive and stuff, different types of headsets? So, normally, uh, if you're in VR, either you, are, you have to stand within sort of a box and you can look around like this, <coughs> but you can't really move unless you have external sensors set up around you, which is a bit Im impractical. If you have a SLAM solution, we actually developed this type of SLAM solution on a, a, a normal phone, which is kind of the, uh, the hardware is really not calibrated for this type of endeavor, but anyway, just to show how powerful it, it is. Um, then you can actually, using only the phone, uh, and the IMU and the accelerometer and the gyroscope and the camera in the phone, you can walk around in a 3D space in VR. That you cannot do with only visual odometry because you don't have um, you don't have sort of the loop closing and the relocalization, which basically means that if you walk around using only visual odometry, now I'm becoming really technical here, so just like shout out if if it's too technical, but basically if you only uh, use the IMU and the gyroscope and the accelerometer and the camera uh, to kind of mathematically calculate your movements, you will always have a drift. If you also build a map. When you come back to the same position, uh, you will recognize the position and you can sort of adjust for the drift. So it becomes much more precise. Yeah? Mm -hmm. One more. Mm -hmm. Sorry, could you repeat the question? We have algorithms for the sensor fusion as well, yeah. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're using deep learning when required, uh, and I think my, my explanation was a bit simplified uh, in order for sort of non-scientists, uh, non such as myself, <laughs> to understand. Uh, so we use deep learning for some of the tasks, um, like, um, okay, I, I, will not, I will not exemplify where exactly we use deep learning, because I might be a bit on thin ice here. So because, uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm not the programmer, so I'll stay safe. But we use deep learning for some of the tasks. I think most, but yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so just in a moment, there's a break. But first... But first, give me a slide, yeah. Come, 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 yes, here we go. Okay, I just wanted to uh, uh, remind you what's uh, coming after the break. Uh, I will let you go for the break. Uh, so, um, after the break, uh, Saron will uh, come and talk about his experiences uh, and provide some, uh, yeah, share some insights around autonomous systems and their challenges, as he calls it. Uh, so that's also a main talk. Then we go through these lightning talks, so these very short five-minute talks uh, where there's no Q&A. And, &A. and uh, as you can tell from the list, is it readable? Yeah. Um, it's pretty broad. Um, is uh, Maximilian here? Okay, perfect, yep. Um, which country are you from? Uh, 
Okay, start off from Germany. And uh, there is a uh, big out of uh, academia, uh, local startups. And yes, I think Peter will come over here uh, to talk about his uh, robot, uh, which was the one you saw uh, cleaning the floor over at uh, Open Lab. Cool. Did uh, Pierre, did you get here to talk about KGH, uh, former student? Awesome. Uh, so uh, if you were here, uh, if you were one of the hardcore fans that uh, was here for the robotics um, uh, meetup, we actually had a KGH uh, formula student talk about their efforts for uh, you know, formula driving, and uh, you're going to talk about the autonomous ones. Is that right? Cool. Okay, so that's all after the break. And uh, I think we're going to do 20 minutes, so it is um, 20, quarter to eight, quarter to eight. In this building, we're going to do a... Um, Stockholm Makerspace tour. Yay. Here's Kalle. Kalle is going to give you a tour of Stockholm Makerspace if you're interested. And if you're at Open Lab, then um, JB or Mike will give you a tour of Open Lab. See you after the break. Um, if you're a if you're doing a lightning talk, then uh, please come up during the break and uh, test your gear.
Check one, two. Uh, is the Makerspace tour team back? Okay, if you were on a Makerspace tour, please raise your hand. Nobody. Okay, we're going to start. So uh, we have someone. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Let's uh, get ready for the second half. And uh, I am encouraged and happy that you're all trying to speak even louder than me. Because that means you're enjoying yourself and you like uh, the people that you're meeting. So that's really awesome. That's, that's really um, perhaps even more important than the contents of the talk is um, being able to talk together over here here we go okay so um second half i think uh, everybody from open lab i think came back here to uh things and uh we don't have a fixed plan but uh maybe uh, jb or my uh, mikael you could uh, come and talk about like if somebody wants to uh, pass by open lab on the way when they leave to uh, kind of check out the robotics and stuff it would be nice to know how to do it Okay, so uh, now second half. First off, that's an odd color. Yeah. Is that on purpose? Okay. Well, what do I know about slides anyway? Like, I, <laughs> I don't know the first thing about slides. I'm sorry, I'll take it back. Uh, if it's not black and white and in like courier typeface, I'm like, whoa, I can't see it. Okay, uh, first off, um, we have uh, one main talk, and then we have seven, I think, lightning talks. The lightning talks are very diverse, uh, covers uh, broad ground. I, I look forward to it. First off, uh, we have Saron, please give him a hand. Hey, my name is uh, Soren. I come from um, CAMCOM Research and Ten Technology. Um, so there are a lot of talks on how systems, uh, autonomous systems work. I'm going to do a very brief introduction. I think Ingrid actually uh, took it to, to a very nice level. Then I'm going to dance on everyone's parade, like very few of the many problems that haven't been solved, try and explain some of the challenges that may not be obvious to everyone, uh, and give some considerations on uh, or ask some questions to whether industry should maybe uh, work together or, or work towards. Uh, most people don't know Comcom, um, but uh, all of the, like any automotive company, trucking company, or industrial company that has vehicles, Comcom has done something for them, including Scania and, and so on. So it started out as a product development company in 2001. Anything radio frequency, wireless connectivity, autonomous systems, safety systems, signal processing, the godfather of deep learning, uh, and industrial IoT, uh, we've done it. Uh, roughly 200 engineers and researchers, uh, average experience of 16 uh, years per person, and more than 25% are PhDs. Uh, the rest are roughly masters, and I'm one of the few, few bot bachelors. My background, the last 10 years, I built a Northern European version of, uh, or competitor to Uber. Uh, I've tried to build an electric microbus, failed, but uh, still built one that actually drove. Uh, worked with autonomous systems a couple of years, uh, lately uh, for a big Silicon Valley based ride hailing company. Uh, if we look at the autonomous drive part of ComCom, it's sem sensor synchronization, it's object detection, collision avoidance uh, that was uh, spoken about earlier, sensor fusion. Um, ComCom is big in radar technology, has built their own 4D uh, radar, imaging radar, high resolution, working on radar neural networks, radar SLAM. Uh, we're working on next generation vehicle and vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure communications, and we have a, I think by any standard, a massive functional safety department uh, and built deterministic systems. 
very high level. We've already gone through this, so I'm going to do the next one. That's a slightly more complex version of what Ingrid showed. Um, we verse in almost every of those boxes uh, out of the 200 engineers. Um, whether it's a building, an actual LiDAR or a RIDAR, uh, whether it's fusing them, whether it's localization, uh, motion prediction, um, road friction estimators, we've actually built that for uh, some of the Swedish cars you see on the road here uh, in the top line vehicles, so ego state estimators, uh, state estimators, ego state estimators. Um, whether it's the control loop, the computation side, the path planning, uh, we verse in all of them. So uh, these are just a c like, there are a million problems we haven't solved yet and I'm just going to address some f a few of them that we don't normally talk about. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about power consumption, weather uh, predictions and uh, the cost of these uh, systems. So, uh, Neural networks have actually improved exponentially the last couple of years, especially. Uh, semantics picture segmentation has brought us from, like, just a year ago, we had YOLO 9000, where we could classify with roughly 80% 80 um, 80 confidence level. Now we're actually getting closer and closer to 100%. The problem is we're extremely confident also in being wrong. So... Uh, we might misplace or like uh, look at a, a person as something else uh, and then say we are 100% right. Uh, the problem with those massive improvements on SLAM, on perception systems, on prediction solutions is actually that they keep getting more and more power hungry. So uh, a fairly well optimized autonomous system end to end will consume roughly three kilowatt hours or kilowatt per hour. Uh, if you want that autonomous vehicle to be a shared vehicle, a bus like Scania or something like that, to drive 16 hours a day, just the battery consumption, without moving a centimeter, just the battery consumption, that's 50% of the biggest Tesla battery you can get today. So we have a race on towards putting electric cars on the road while the power consumption keeps going up and up and up to actually try and solve self-driving. So there are some oxymorons here that, that, I mean, we need to solve it some way. Um, then we have uh, SLAM. For those of you who maybe saw it, Yandex actually uploaded a quite neat... Uh, uh, do we have some... I think my presentation is crashing now. No? Yeah, it started out so. Oh, that's actually a light eye in heavy snow that you saw there last minute. So, Google Slides, everyone. Uh, what I was trying to show you was a Yandex driving in snow. Uh, trying to localize itself. They're actually doing quite well, so kudos to them. Uh, the second was actually that you saw a brief second was uh, heavy snow around a LiDAR. Uh, so uh, bad weather is still very, very far away from being solved. Just like uh, the individual snowflakes that the LiDAR saw represents an object that is going to be put in a point cloud and it's going to make the computation needs explode to actually try and filter it out and figure out what's actually an object, what's not an object. Um, I think Google is now early trying to test out in, in Michigan, uh, but, but we're far away from having solved it. Um, I'm going to talk about later again how we can solve that. I'm having video issues here. Uh, the video was uh, showing on a new crash. Uh, so for plat <laughs> try again. Um, forget it. The point was uh, we saw a very beautiful video on platooning from uh, Scania. Um, 
they most likely use a V2X communication standard uh, that's basically Wi-Fi, just enhanced Wi-Fi. The problem with uh, 5.9 gigahertz, uh, gigahertz is it gives zero direction. You're basically just broadcasting uh, a location and what you intend to do. The problem is most vehicle, even uh, self-driving vehicles, even though we try and localize ourselves with SLAM and, and other uh, means, um, we have drift and we are inherently inaccurate, which means on a highway or in a city, you end up having a ton of vehicles broadcasting inherently inaccurate locations. So why are this bandwidth? Technically, you don't know whether it's the vehicle in front of you or to the side that's telling you, I'm going to brake now or I'm going to turn left. It's a problem that when there are only four Scania's in a row, then it's fairly easy to solve. You can sort of uh, analyze and, and oh, it's fine. Uh, you, I mean, it's, it's fairly easy to guess who is who. Uh, so um, the communication standards that are needed to actually try and optimize these uh, are being worked on now. In fact, uh, Comcom and uh, Scania are in a research study together to try and solve it, led by Comcom. So, but if every vehicle was actually linked together, the power consumption needed to try and predict what's going on around us would reduce significantly. Rather than trying to guess where I am by using SLAM, if you actually knew it by having uh, infrastructure markers talk to you, uh, then uh, the computation need to try and guess goes down significantly. Rather than trying to guess what 50 vehicles around you are going to do uh, and, and thus infer what the drivable area is and then do your path planning. Uh, if they talk together, you could actually reduce the power consumption considerably. Yep. Come on. Uh, I didn't hear the question. Uh, massively, and, and, and so, I mean, yeah, so that the question was uh, the one and a half kilowatt, uh, that's a very arbitrary number. It's it, like, uh, the point is the power goes down, and we've done some initial studies that shows it where you can bring it down significantly by removing guessing factors throughout the layers of the stack. Um, obviously, if you drive on open road with no maps and, and very few visual cues to actually localize yourself, uh, then it becomes more difficult. Did I freeze it for you? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> that was terrible. Good help. Thanks, Una. I should not be let anywhere near these decks again. <laughs> Uh, the next is the actual cost of uh, of the kit, um, which is uh, and like most autonomous efforts these days, they they throw a ton of expensive sensors on it, um, a ton of computation. You have entire data centers there uh, that are driving around, uh, and th and this is assuming um, these figures are assuming a, a, a full sensing and computation kit of 35,000 US dollars, which is no one has achieved that at this point. Also not Waymo or any Swedish companies or anything. We're far away. Whenever you see a big turning LiDAR on the top, assume that that's $10,000 in itself, at least. Uh, more for other companies. So uh, this is just to give a small context of um, where should society actually push the systems towards? It, like Right now, most efforts are going into passenger cars, uh, but uh, it's a very inefficient way of actually utilizing these sensing kits. Uh, and and um, uh, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big uh, fan of, of uh, looking at how you can optimize mass transit in cities. Um, rather than putting it on big um, buses that are not very dynamic in their routing, 
uh, and difficult to move around cities, and rather than passenger cars for the wealthy people, uh, there are ways to actually optimize the cost here. Um, that's my take on how um, the self-driving ecosystem is going to move in terms of when you look at uh, departure frequency and convenience, when you remove away the cost of the bus driver or the chauffeur. Uh, you can actually increase the departure of your asset, whatever type of asset that is, uh, without uh, incurring a lot of extra cost. So owning a self-driving car is not going to be cheaper for you. Uh, but trying to apply that on, on vehicles that are uh, easier to actually apply on mass transit uh, becomes a very interesting uh, um, application. Finally, some uh, considerations. Right now, we have a race that's very monopoli uh, monopolistic. Uh, so should we actually push towards uh, forcing, enforcing that uh, companies have to share high-definition uh, map updates to make sure that um, we bring the cost down uh, of, of the systems? Charging stations are also now, that's a land grab. You see big companies putting down options for real estate around so they can put their charging stations there, which uh, is going to be a massive barrier for any other uh, company that actually wants to solve self-driving. The ve vehicle to anything uh, infrastructure needs to be completely redesigned. 5.9 gigahertz is not going to solve uh, vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to uh, infrastructure communications. It's simply, it's not a safe standard. It's not a real time solution, which means like even if I got an accurate location from you, I, don't, I can actually not guarantee the package delivery of that uh, data. Um, so, um, the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications needs to include relative position because you can't trust the uh, location that you're actually broadcasting. Um, we need some kind of encryption key standard to actually communicate with each other so people can't hack each other. Um, I'm a big fan of radars. Uh, Comcom is working on the next generation uh, imaging radars. Uh, I believe that the radar will be the primary sensor of a self-driving vehicles within the next five to 10 years, simply because it's a lot cheaper uh, than LIDARs and it works in any weather. Uh, in the, uh, and lastly, um, should companies, self-driving developers, should they share their simulators and test frameworks um, to actually aggregate the difficult driving scenarios we're trying to solve here? Um, this is an image that's made from a radar, from above a massive radar on a, on a plane. Uh, but it's to show, show with the right amount of uh, power and uh, beam steering, you can actually get beautiful pictures with radars. And that technology is slowly creeping into vehicles, slowly. It's been for jet fighters and big planes so far, and military and defense, but it's slowly coming to uh, the rest of the systems. That was it. Would you have, uh, would you have time for questions? If, uh yep. So come again. Yeah, uh, IR cameras. Yeah, I mean. I've worked with them, and I think it's a super interesting uh, technology. Uh, it's, a very, um, it's a very expensive technology. Uh, the resolution is fairly low. I mean, uh, I think FLIR is slowly starting to push it to 640 uh, by 480. So we're in the, in, in the VGA resolution at this point. Uh, and I think uh, the big problem with the technology is that it uses rare earth metals, so th like there is no there's no clear path to how you bring the cost of that sensor down. But for certain applications, it's interesting. I mean, um, mining applications, queries and everything have big issues with LIDAR simply because of dust. Um, we're doing applications now for uh, construction equipment where <laughs> the vehicle, when it breaks, uh, it creates a dust cloud around it and then uh, the self-driving competences of that vehicle completely breaks down. So, and then they've asked us whether we can help it come out of the dust cloud because the LiDAR uh, can't see through it. 
Yep. Um, so the question is whether we're working on distributed um, communication between vehicle and infrastructure. Yeah. Um, so I'm a big fan of it, and it's uh, part. So we're building uh, patents have just been filed. We're working on, uh, amongst others, radar transponders that will improve SLAM and be able to share information with each other. So uh, I think it will be part of the future. Hopefully, um, it's going to bring down any. Uh, computational need for uh, for predicting object so motion predicting of third party objects yep Uh, I'll talk about that. Yeah, so I'll, yeah um, I guess the question was whether you can apply new technology to bring down the computation cost uh, and, and, and energy usage. Uh, I, I think to a certain extent, uh, on the radar side, we're applying like technology that are normally not used by tier ones because it's too expensive for consumer cars, amongst others. Um, yeah, so uh, what, what's the advantages and disadvantages of using LiDAR versus uh, radar? I mean, it's, it's a very, um, so to use, uh, to, to use uh, Elon Musk's saying, I think a couple of days ago, uh, sending out photons at a wavelength uh, where there's a high risk of occlusion uh, makes no sense. And I think that's literally what he said or something like that. Uh, he's basically saying, the LiDAR is crap when it's raining and snowing, and so you can't use it. And it's super expensive, um, and m most of the, um, the LiDARs uh, that you have out there, they don't have a clear path to actually either reaching a size or a cost that's attractive to a self-driving car. So Elon Musk's take is what's coming first within the next five years. Um, neural networks and AI chips that work in any weather uh, at an uh, attractive power consumption level uh, or a low-cost LiDAR um, that would look beautifully on a car. Uh, and his bet is the first. No. Um, Quick. Uh, so, uh, how do you? So, the the radar is actually so the lidar does not give you speed of objects at all. Uh, it only gives you range, uh, and it gives you very little light um, in 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 your sensing. Um, the question was, how do you get that from a, a radar? So, the radar is actually the best sensor you have out there to give you range and Doppler. So, uh, you you send out a wave, and it scatters, and then you measure the time it took and and uh, and you can get the speed of that object um, and then if you then take the newer RFICs that are coming out uh, and and a shit ton of signal processing and neural networks you can actually create an image like a camera so you have range Doppler uh, and then you have obviously your 2d space uh, that a 40 radar last question Thanks for your time. Good job. Good job, Thanks, John. Um, I was thinking, uh, so now it's time for lightning talks. Um, and the lightning talks are five minutes max for each person. I think there's seven. So if we're efficient, it's six minutes per person. So it's like 45 minutes or less. I was thinking maybe we should do power first. What do you think? Um, sorry to uh, change the plan. Is that all right? 
uh, because uh, there was. I'm just thinking there was a bunch of talk about power, power consumption, and so on. And I think you're going to talk about um, how that might change. Is that right? Okay, I'm confused. Where Maximilian? Yeah. Okay, so you, I'm, I'm just confused <laughs> by. I don't know. I don't know what it is with me today. I think you are both sitting too close to Ted, and that confused me. Maximilian, that's exactly what I thought would make sense, that you would come and talk to us about how you're going to solve this whole power problem. I'll try and find Okay, cool. So please welcome uh, Maximilian to the stage, because he will solve your power problems. Which table do I need? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Max. Uh, I'm CEO and co-founder of Selexica, and, and we ho heard many times like power, we heard like compute cluster, we heard, you know, supercomputer, um, which is exactly what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, and I think for most, it's, so one part of it is a hardware problem, but you know, I think the answer at the end to the, to the power problem is actually a software problem. So I apologize for talking a lot about software in a hardware meetup, um, but I think, you know, they're very much uh, um, connected. So what you hear see what you see here is actually a lot of different topics, a lot of promises, a lot of you know prototypes. No matter if you talk about self-driving cars, if you talk about 5G base stations, you know AR, AI, VR, lots of you know big promises. It's going to come really soon. You know we believe we are actually quite far away, um, and I want to go into some of the challenges um, why you know we think we're actually far away. So what they all have in common, you know, they feature very intelligent applications, you know, and, and what that means is you need all the processing capabilities, all the compute power you can actually get. Um, and there was a lot of innovation in hardware, right? Obviously, you know, PC era started, um, you go to your laptop, your mobile, you know, arms and, and those kind of things. And now you have a lot of specialized, let's say, compute capabilities, right? There was a question earlier, do I need a GPU or an FPGA? I agree, everybody should know what an FPGA is, so we can talk about that later. So lots of different things. But the answer actually for autonomy, for example, self-driving cars, is actually you're going to have a mix of all those different chips on the same cluster, right, on the same supercomputer. So, you know, I think nobody disagrees there um, that all future mega trends are going to be enabled by next generation supercomputing, by heterogeneous supercomputing, combining all those different technologies we saw on the previous slide actually in one big chip. Um, and actually, if you talk to vendors, you know, they think, I, I need several of those chips, right? Whatever the latest, greatest platform out there is, um, it's not going to be good enough for level five really autonomous car. Um, and, you know, everybody agrees with that, whoever you're talking to. But then, you know, if you read some marketing stuff, you know, it sounds like we're done. Um, you know, we're close and Waymo is driving around um, with his self-driving cars. But actually, if you open the trunk, you see something like this, right? Um, where certainly the power problem is not solved, but especially, you know, one part of the key problem is like how to integrate it in a, you know, a supercomputer in the middle of the car. Um, that's certainly not solved. You have a bunch of applications running on very, very powerful supercomputers, but, you know, basically burning, burning your trunk. So if you really want to talk about autonomous vehicles, certainly, you know, there needs to be a huge amount of innovation, you know, really driving that supercomputer from the trunk to your actual supercomputer in the middle of your, your car, right? So if you look in, into the actual problem, right, why is it hard going from a big fat Intel machine to a, you know, embedded device, heterogeneous supercomputer? If you look, look into the history of software development and hardware, you actually started, you know, single application, single processor. Looks like a pretty easy problem, right? You press a button, your compiler, you know, you generate code, you're, you're done, right? If you look at the next generation of that, it already gets a little bit more difficult. Um, you have, you know, some kind of parallel application, right? Complicated, dynamic applications doing slime, doing perception, path planning, all those kind of algorithms. And they're going to run at some kind of, you know, small supercomputer, heterogeneous multi-cores, so heterogeneous meaning already different types of cores, right? Some ARMs, some DSPs, and so on. But now the problem even bigger, you know, you saw the box earlier from Zirin, I guess, you know, you had a lot of different algorithms, um, you know, um, and they all will run on the same platform, not on the same cluster maybe, but certainly all on the same platform, right? They're all going to talk to each other. They're all going to exchange data. They're all going to create contention on your on your supercomputer, and of course, you know that's going to be really really hot, and you have a huge huge power problem, right? So 
So what we've built, and you know, we started like 15 years ago, to us, one of the key things is software. Software running on those chips, right? If you can optimize the software, suddenly you don't need such a big system burning all that power, but you can actually use different types of systems, right? So what we did you know, for a long time, we use compiler technology to actually automatically understand your code. We just look at your code, we know exactly which kind of platform you would need, right? We build a model of your application. Well, if you have a model of your application and you create that automatically, well, now I can also optimize that model, right? Find further parallelism, distribute it better, distribute it for performance, distribute it for power efficiency, right? Average power at the end is a problem because that's creating your heat. So if I can distribute in a smarter way your software, you're going to save a lot of power, right? And then the third step, right? Well, if you have a huge you know, model of your application, you're not going to manually change your code again, right? So certain, uh, uh, certainly there needs to be a third step, how you integrate that into existing toolings because you know, there are hundreds of different tools and, and, and workflows. So you know, with that concept of analyze, optimize, implement, how does that actually look like in a car, right? You're going to have a high performance cluster. You're going to have an FPGA probably do, you know, getting your, your point cloud, doing sensor fusion. That sensor fusion from the FPGA is going to send data to your AI chip, right? Recognizing is it a bird or a person or a truck or whatever it's going to be. GPU at the same time is going to do a 360 degree surround view. Also, you know, now trying to fuse that together with your AI chip, right? So that's just some example of what's going on in the supercomputer. Um, and the key problem, and you know, don't read all the details. The key message here is. Um, the applications running on those different chips, they're actually very woman, uh, very different types of application, right? You're going to have a CUDA stack, you're going to have a neural network, you're going to have dynamic C++ application, you have very static time slot based software development, which needs to be certified, right? Very different models of computation all, all have to run on the, on the same chip. So what we're also building, you know, this full system simulation, Show me your code, I can tell you exactly how it's going to behave on your system, optimizing for power, performance, um, and so on. So if any of, any of that is, is of interest, uh, headquarters in Cologne, we're around 50 people, you see a couple of logos of our customers. Um, yeah, that's basically it. If you want to see latest, greatest hardware, like a Drive PX or something, you know, feel free to come by in, in Cologne. Thank you. Let's talk about it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, that was uh, the first of the lightning talks. Um, could you, uh, Marek, could you uh, drop this on the uh, projector? Okay, so uh, that was Maximilian. Then we've got uh, Jana to talk about um, formal methods-based motion planning. We've got James. Right, this time I got it, to talk about uh, satellite navigation, Leonard, and uh, Lena, are you uh, also still here? Yeah. Okay, there, perfect. Petter, uh, did Petter come, come back? Okay, awesome, hi, Petter. Did you bring your uh, vacuum cleaner or did you leave it at Open Lab? Okay, mm -hmm. so I'll come by on the way. Uh, and Pierre, you're still here, right? Okay, Pierre will talk about autonomous KCH. Okay, great. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Cool. Uh, Jana, you ready? Cool. So uh, please welcome Jana to the stage. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jana, I'm an assistant professor here at KTH. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, it's going to be essentially an essence about one very narrow problem that we are trying to tackle with my group of one PhD student. So um, uh, it's called formal methods based motion planning for autonomous driving. So first of all, what is motion planning? So in motion planning, your goal is actually to go from A to B while avoiding obstacles. So there is your autonomous forklift. You want to go, yeah, uh, there is your green go region. There are a bunch of red obstacles. You want to go. Uh, so it's somewhere in between a low level control and let's say 
high level path planning, routing, stuff like that. And the technique that we chose to, to go with is RT star. Um, so it's sampling based technique. Uh, you throw through a bunch of samples in the space. You try to connect them. It's kind of have a bunch of interesting properties. It's anytime incremental, asymptotically complete and optimal. So you can actually like keep shooting, improving your path as you go and you go. Um, and it can compute in real time and the more it compute, the better it gets. Uh, well, now in autonomous driving, uh, what's the problem is that you have a bunch of road rules on top of your go from A to B, right? So those road rules could be something like do not enter the sidewalk, do not go in the wrong lane. Um, if there are two obstacles close to each other, do not do crazy stuff, do not go back to the right lane, then back to the left lane. Um, there is a Vienna Convention that actually says um, all of these, uh, states all of these rules. So it turns out that we can uh, take these rules and specify them in some kind of logic. So suddenly we have them. Sorry. Oh, so suddenly we have them rigorously captured. Don't worry about how we really do that. Uh, let me just say it's a temporal logic, somewhat close to propositional, just bunch of other operators. People are working on uh, formalizing Vienna Convention into this so that we get a complete set of rules. Uh, now, our goal is to go from A to B while avoiding obstacles and following the road rules. So what you hope for is, this is the very simplified thing, if the purple stuff is the sidewalk, you just want to go in the right lane and reach the goal region in the optimal way. Uh, so, it turns out we can do RT star with additional temporal logic constraints if we just fit it in and it works pretty nicely. But this is not how life works, right? Um, sometimes the road rules are simply not feasible. So if you are in a green car, you are going to the, to the B spot. So far, so good. There is a red car standing there. Um, are you going to say abort mission? No, you are going to go. Right, and this is something that we want the autonomous vehicles to do some uh, as well, to somehow smartly disobey the road rules just for the time that they need to do that. So uh, we developed this least violating RT star. So what it does is essentially it weights the satisfaction of the formulas with some numbers, and uh, you fit it into RT star. What comes out is uh, the path that is going tightly by the obstacles. We don't have to say it, go tightly by the obstacle. It computes by itself. So essentially, uh, this is uh, from a few years back. This is uh, an implementation of, uh, of the least violating RT star on, um, on Singapore golf cart at the uh, Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. I worked with uh, MIT on this project, um, it went tightly by the obstacle. So this is the computation of the RT star. You can see how, uh, how the target region is gradually shifting. We go, compute, take the best, and we keep going. And uh, there should be one more. Uh, yeah, so here you see it goes by the obstacle and kind of returns back. Um, we don't have to tell it. It's, yeah, it's silly when you compare it to where we are today, but yeah. Uh, anyways, if we look a little bit more into the future, we will probably have fleets of autonomous vehicles. All of them will be autonomous. They will be able to collaborate on actually achieving what they want to achieve together. So that's what we are looking into right now. Uh, into some sort of socially optimal motion plans for everyone. And that requires that we do motion planning in joint spaces of the vehicles. This is my uh, student's latest work. Again, very silly simulations, but again, I have one per person team plus a few collaborators. Uh, well, that's basically it. Thank you. If you have questions, email me, please. Okay, thanks. Yes, James, let's do it. So um, James will talk about satellite nav.
Please welcome James. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to be wrestling with my internal monologue that's telling me not to do any beatbox, so hopefully none will come out. So yeah, I'm going to talk about satellite navigation for autonomy. We've had a lot of discussions about other sensors and GPS, GNSS, satellite navigation. We all know that it has problems, but I'm going to talk about the benefits and how we're trying to address some of the problems that, that we can have with it. So satellite navigation tries to answer the problem of where, um, particularly for autonomous vehicles. Um, but where relative to what? Um, often you need a map or you need some other reference. Um, do you want to know where you are relative to landmarks, to the lanes of the road, um, or do you want to know where you are to other platforms and users? Now, what GNSS gives you is an all-weather absolute reference. It's a globally known position that you can use to communicate your position between vehicles and communicate your position with respect to a map so you can uh, locate yourself relative to that. Um, so it does a very good job of answering, of answering where, but it also does a very good job of answering when. Um, if you want to synchronize data for collaborative navigation or sharing information, you really need to know when the information is valid for, because knowing where you were two seconds ago doesn't really matter in uh, high-velocity high autonomous vehicles. Um, brief overview of GNSS te technology. Um, Lots of satellites up in the sky, they send eff effectively a timing signal down to a receiver, in this case a truck. Um, lots of constellations out there, Chinese, Russian, American, and European. Um, Japan and India also have local systems that they have up and running. Um, if you have a reference station with either a known location or the ability to share its information, then you can provide assistance, and compared to the five, 10 meters you get with a mobile phone, you can get down to around two centimeters accuracy, providing there's good conditions. So, challenges. I already mentioned good conditions. Um, satellites transmit at roughly 20 watts, so if you imagine a 20 watt light bulb up in space, you're trying to see that down on Earth. It's about 21,000 kilometers between the satellite and us. It's a pretty low signal uh, strength when it gets to us. Um, Buildings are very good blockers. People are very good blockers. Foliage is very good blockers. So you need good conditions to have good signals. The reference networks as well. There are many reference networks globally installed, but if you're not covered by a reference network, you can't make use of the assistance. You can't get down to the kind of accuracy that we need. Um, robustness as well. I already mentioned blockages from, from buildings, but there are many unmodeled errors, ionospheric scintillation, um, reflection, multipath that cause problems for performance. Um, and then there's jamming. Um, and jamming is where the noise floor is raised to the point that you can't track the signals. And there's spoofing. Spoofing is when someone mimics the signals and tries to convince your truck, car, boat, plane that you're in a different place. Um, classic case happened, a uh, US Navy ship went into Chinese water because they believed China had spoofed the US Navy's secure GPS. Um, ongoing efforts in the region, uh, specifically the region of GNSS, but also in Sweden. Um, this group of companies and institutes are funded by the EU. Um, you can see Scania there. Um, this project is going to take a truck and allow it to make intelligent decisions when there is on-road um, for a motorway behind uh, or requires the truck to anticipate what the car behind is going to do in order to let another vehicle on. Um, it sounds relatively trivial for humans. We change lanes and we pull out, but um, for self-driving trucks, anticipating what a car behind you is going to do is very difficult. And so that's why we've taken this challenge as a specific challenge for this project. Um, you can see here uh, the small blue box. That's an RSU, a roadside unit. We also mentioned if infrastructure is going to help uh, with autonomous vehicles and their decision making. This RSU is one element that we um, will have for this project that not only shares uh, GPS information or GNSS information, it also shares radar and other images. So the group of companies here are all Sweden-based, and this company, uh, this group of companies, are also working on a project called NPAD, that's Network Positioning for Autonomous Driving. Um, we have some other players, Ericsson, Volvo, you know, um, the Ordnance Survey Company here in Sweden, um, Einride, a small self-driving truck startup, 
And the purpose of this is to develop the network side uh, that required for high accuracy positioning. The network side is pretty much going to be a 3GPP mobile standard. So in all the mobile networks, we expect the kind of information to be available so that the two centimeters I mentioned earlier is going to be available not only um, nationally, but European-wide and internationally, globally, hopefully. Um, so uh, last little pitch. If you're interested in this, there's a, confer a conference in Gothenburg in the middle of May. Um, please go there. There's a whole section on autonomous driving from everyone from Ericsson to Scania to, to, to Volvo AB. Um, be interested in the subject for those interested in autonomy. And that's everything for me. Any questions? Oh, no questions. Thanks, man. Okay, so um, I just realized, did, did anyone but me realize that I said I was going to do a raffle about the QuirkBot ticket, but then I didn't do it? You, uh, you Daniel did. You've been here so many times, you, you knew I was going to forget it. So do, should, should we do the raffle? Like, do, should we do the raffle for the QuirkBot ticket, or should we just do something else with it? You want to do it? Okay. Who said do it? You're the only one who said anything. Maybe we'll just give it to you, Inga. <laughs> Okay, cool. Here's what we're going to do. It's going to be pretty simple. We're just going to boot this thing up. Uh, you're going to take your phone. You're going to go in on the last slide. Enter the raffle. Put your name in. This is assuming that you're even interested, right? If you're not interested, don't do it. If you're interested, QuirkBot kit. And uh, if you like, you can come to the workshop next month. Okay. Um, I don't have a super solution for this, but what I'm thinking is... Uh, you're just going to like turn the display off. I'm going to go point somewhere on the screen and uh, you're going to turn it back on and whoever I point on will get the thing. What do you think? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was thinking that seems low tech and reasonable. Um, give it another 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Five, two. Okay, cool. So take it away so I'm not look. I, is it away? Okay, I see. Okay, okay, yeah, right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Screenshot it. Boom! Alexandra! Alexandra? Okay, where is Alexandra? Uh, is Alexandra downstairs? Is Alexandra online? This was, uh, I did not expect this. <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, Alexandra, come see me and. Um, if we can't find Alexandra in a couple of lightning talks time, we'll do it again. Okay, cool, that was interesting. Okay, cool, um, here we go, lightning talks. Okay, yes, and then we have Leonard followed by Lena, I think, is that right? Yes, Leonard? Yep, yep. Oh, perfect. You're gonna, are you gonna plug in or? Okay, cool, so uh, please le uh, welcome Leonard. Hello, Lena Karlsson is my name. Uh, I'm a CEO and co-founder of Blue Ocean Robotics Sweden. And what do we do? We do th two things. We provide new innovative robots to the market. And based on identified needs, we develop new robots in strategic partnerships with different, it could be other entrepreneurs, it could be uh, customers, it could be suppliers. Uh, I have some robots we have in our portfolio. Uh, we have the Beam telepresence robot. Maybe you have seen uh, Edward Snowden having a TEDx with a telepresence or, or uh, Sheldon in Big Bang Theory addressing it. Uh, this is a new model coming this summer uh, that you see on this screen. We are also showing some uh, uh, robots that we have developed ourselves in Denmark. Uh, it's a Walmo, a robot for mounting of glass, partition, uh, glass and partition walls. Uh, UVDR robot for disinfection of uh, hospital rooms. Uh, we have a uh, multi-tower for lifting patients or moving patients in, in hospitals between beds and toilets and so on. But what I would like to talk to you about today is share with you some experiences 
of implementing robotics in other applications than uh, production industry out in society. And especially this one that gave, gave echo to one of the biggest uh, newspapers in Sweden. Welcome, dear robot. And uh, I will show you what, what kind of robot am I talking about. So it's a scrubber dryer robot for cleaning uh, large areas. It's used in hospitals, in uh, airports, it's used in, in subway stations, it's uh, uh, train stations and I'm showing this how it works. It's cleaning the floor like this. It is 100% autonomous uh, and uh, in this kind of business the salary is about 85% of the cost. So this is very easy to get payback. So, as I said, implementation. Well, this is robot, very good. You have done it all. Cost efficient, easy to use, simple to interface, so ergonomic, modular, easy to upgrade. Perfect, now we made it. But it's not true, because now you have only done 20%. 80% is now sales and marketing efforts for years, if, if you're unlucky. Uh, and not only that, when you get sales, you come into this. You have to bring the robot successfully to the users. This is uh, key people. This is Musa and Annette. And they are really key people for getting success successful robot uh, installations. So wh what do we do? to avoid, it's so easy for them to just, yeah, I forgot it in the, in, the, uh, in the storage, so I do it myself. So what we do is together in management of the customer, uh, running a up to 16 weeks uh, innovation project to give the customer a safe and successful uh, implementation, find the right way to organize, because it's so easy for us to stay where we are and keep on doing what we do. And change is very difficult for us humans. So this is extremely important. And of course, for the customer, they want to pay back of the investment. So in our world, the product is just a seed. But if you implement it in a correct way, my customer and I can pick the fruits, uh, but it takes time. And here is a picture from this installation. Now all the people have found what they should do. It's robot and human in, in perfect harmony in cooperation. So you could say in the industry, you talk about industry 4.0, uh, uh, co-working robots, but this is co-working in a completely un another way. And you, as you can see, now those guys are confident using the robots and this will uh, keep on moving for many many years thank you very much thank you awesome yeah okay there we go yep Okay, please uh, welcome Lena to the stage. <laughs> Lena without slides, sorry Lena. Oh, here we go. Okay, excellent. It's good when it works. Hi everyone, I'm Lena. 
So I work as an associate professor at Uppsala University in product development. My training is, however, as a geneticist and a neurobiologist. I'm also the co-founder or the founder of a consulting bureau called Resource Technology that facilitates the introduction of new technologies into healthcare and education. I'd like to start to give you the take-home message with my talk. To use autonomous robotic system in healthcare to the full potential, we need to develop this technology so it meets the biology. We also need to work, as Lennart mentioned, to get the right tech to the right place with the right information. Why is this important? Well, accidents, injuries, diseases happens at any time, anyhow, and to anyone. And when that is the case, we don't want to be taken care of. We want to be part of driving our recovery. And today we are living in an info-medicine society. We are also living in a technology revolution that makes it possible for us to be part of our recovery in a way that has never been before. And by doing that, we are using e-health, biosensors, serious games, and robots. This is a rehabilitation robot. It's a hybrid robot that reads the signals from the brain down to the muscles, going through the central and the peripheral nervous system. Let me show you how it works. So, when I think that I want to move my leg, electrical signals goes in between the nerve cells, from the brain, through the spinal cord, down to the muscles, to these EMGs on my leg. And I move my leg, and the robot also moves its legs. If the case is, as Diane, I met her in 2015, she had a horse riding accident and hurt her spinal cord. These signals were weakened to the point where the muscles couldn't read it out, but the robot could still detect it and help with the step. And it is in this way, this semi-autonomous system, I would say, helps a person to recover an ability to move. And the beautiful thing about <laughs> these systems is that they work with biology. They meet the four most important factors we need for cell recovery in the nerve system. Frequency, intensity. By using a robot, you can walk for 30 to 40 minutes, or 60 even, <laughs> without being able to stand up and move at all. If you were doing this without this kind of technology, 10 minutes, and you would require at least three physiotherapists. Manner, the other thing that is important, this robot only gives the support needed, which means that you will be in a constant developing phase, which would not be the case if you didn't have something that adjusted to your level of ability. Information. Data is continuously taken in and provided into information to the people who are supporting the training, physios, doctors, relatives, and the person who is doing the training. And that brings us to the last important thing when we have to deal with nerve cell recovery. Psychological factors, motivation. This robot came to Sweden in 2013. It's part of clinical trials since then. It's not implemented into any clinic in Sweden yet. It doesn't reach the patients. And why is that? Lennart mentioned a few of them, but there was other factors, which is robots should not take care of people. First of all, we don't want to be taken care of. Second of all, robots are assistive tools. We have to get this information out. It's part of adjusting. And then we have the question about evidence. So, basically, 
to be able to reach out to develop the right technologies that meets biology, what we need to do is to have information and education on anyone sitting in this room <laughs> developing these things, but we also need to have it to anyone who's going to work with it or use it. And that's where I'm going to end it, this talk. Thank you. Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, I'm calling JB. Uh, turns out. Hey. Hey, JB. Uh, sorry, I need to. The speaker. Okay. Are you there? Video. Should we call you back later? Uh, turns out. Hey, JB. Awesome. Hey. Hey, Alexandra. Uh, so, is Alexandra with you? Can you, can you check the sound? Are you there? Can we call you back later? Time warp. Yeah. JB, is Alexandra with you? Yes, here. Oh, this, this doesn't yeah, yeah, maybe. Hey, Alexandra. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so you won the quirk bot. Uh, where did it go? Here we go. Corkbot and workshop in uh, next month. So uh, I either you can come back here or we'll come over afterwards. <laughs> that was um, a good explanation. Cool. Thanks. Uh, maybe uh, we'll say congratulations to Alexandra. I guess we'll be we'll kind of work. <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, by the way, we'll send out uh, all the details about the workshop and the QuirkBot uh, stuff and the Stockholm Hardware uh, voucher promo codes on uh, the Meetup newsletter mail list. Okay. Okay, cool. Petter and Pierre. Petter first? Yes, good. Please uh, welcome Petter to the stage. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Petter Forsberg. Uh, I work as a software architect at uh, Electrolux, where we develop robotic vacuum cleaners. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about the Pure i9, which is the robot we just launched uh, about six months ago. Uh, this is a, con as a, uh, it's a consumer product, uh, so you need to think about that because a lot of the other things we've seen is more uh, it's not something that every uh, consumer would buy uh, and that puts a different price point of what kind of sensor you can put in this type of product. Uh, so what's uh, unique with this product? First of all, you see the shape. It has like kind of a triangular shape uh, and that's because we put a dust pickup unit in the front. Most robots today are round and they have, the, have it in the middle so they have a really hard time to reach into all the corners and along the edges. Uh, another thing is that the robots are very good at the climbing obstacles. We can climb thresholds up to 2.2 centimeters. Uh, in Scandinavia, we have a lot of thresholds. Uh, the robot is connected, so you can monitor what's going on, uh, set schedule, you can do firmware upgrades over the air. Uh, the robot builds a map of your room using SLUM, as we have heard others talk about today. Uh, if the battery goes low, the robot goes back charging and then it goes, goes back uh, where it, uh, where it stopped. Uh, but uh, what I would like to focus on today is, because this is a hardware meetup, it's about the three division system that we managed to put into this robot. Uh, if you look at the robot and we remove the bumper, this is what you see. Uh, in the front, and here I have hi highlighted uh, the, th the main parts that build up this 3D uh, vision system. It's uh, two laser lines and one camera. Uh, so 
the laser are infrared lasers, so you cannot see them with a normal human eye. Uh, but if you r use a camera that can see infrared light, this is what you would see when a robot moves around. So you see these two laser lines or laser planes. Uh, it's a bit like a 3D scanner, that cheap 3D scanners where you put an object in front of it and rotate. Here it's the other way around. The robot moves around and get this kind of uh, 3D uh, understanding of the world. So simplified, it's, this is kind of what you see. You get a cross section of the world. Uh, and it's the camera, the two, two laser lines, and this uh, an FP FPGA together with an 800 megahertz uh, processor that uh, runs Linux and do all the uh, computations. Um, I'll show you now what the robot actually see. This is one of the debug tools that we use. You see the robot moves around here in an apartment. Uh, you can see in the middle there, and uh, when I also zoom around here, it, that's the threshold. So you see the high detail level we get, which is compared to other robots on the market right now, they, they're not close to this. Uh, we can see the exact level of the height, what's in front of it. Uh, so w if we're gonna uh, climb over the threshold, we can do it in a very uh, safe manner. Here is another, th this is a, like a kitchen, you see several uh, chairs here, like just to the left there is a, this trip trap uh, chair and some other chairs around there, so there's a lot of, a lot of information and data we get there. Um, Soon asked me to s okay, summarize some of the learnings that we got to, to share with this community. So that's what I'm gonna round up with. Um, when you develop such a complex autonomous system like this robot is, uh, you really need to understand what is going on because you have the environment, you have the mechanics, you have the electronics, you have the software, everything is working together. And if you don't really understand what is going on, it, it will be very troublesome. So spend a lot of time on your uh, debug systems and your simulators and so on, uh, because if not, it will be very hard time. Uh, the other thing is the home environments are incredibly challenging. When we build a robot and make it work well in one home environment, then we move it to the next one, we see, oh, now it doesn't work at all in that environment where it was working before. Uh, one way that we mitigated this was that all the developers, uh, we run sprints, two-week sprints, uh, end of the sprint on Thursday, Everybody leaves off the lunch, everybody goes home, take the new release, run the release in all different environments. We come back Friday morning and, and see how did it go. And this has been very powerful for us to iterate quickly and, and learn and uh, develop the system. So this is also yeah, run in your environments. Uh, the last point is about security. This is a connected device and a lot of people are now doing connected devices. If you do it, remember to think about security early because it will affect the whole system, it will affect the hardware, memory size, if you need a secure element. Remember to do it early and bring in good people that do review for you. Yeah, that's my five minutes. Thank you. Good job, Peter, thanks. Um, is, the, uh, is the robot still over at the Open Lab or? Okay, so as you could tell, uh, JB was still over there. So if you know where it is, you can just drop by and uh, knock on the door. He'll let you in. Uh, cool, Pierre. Uh, so this is uh, the last lightning talk of the evening. So please welcome Pierre. Here? Okay. So, hello everybody. Uh, last but uh, not least, I hope. And uh, I'm Pierluigi Dovesi. I'm working uh, in uh, KTH Formula Student Driverless. Third speaker today, so third Italian speaker today. So, you have already got used with the accent, I hope. Good for me. Okay. So, what is KTH Formula Student Driverless? Okay. 
So what is Formula Student? Uh, let's start from this one. Uh, Formula Student, the biggest engineering competition for students in the world. It involves more than 400 universities. Uh, it was founded by Formula One profiles, and uh, it every year it runs many, many competition in uh, really popular circuits like Silverstone, Hockenheim, Red Bull Ring in Austria, for example. Uh, each team is on a profit and uh, financed uh, uniquely by industries and universities. And this year we have a new challenge, in particular the driverless challenge, that is added to the electronic, electric uh, and uh, combustion vehicles. Uh, the challenge is uh, to build uh, new vehicles fully autonomous that is able to run several laps in an unknown environment. Uh, we have many events, like static events, thus cost and manufacturing, business presentation and design presentation for our car. And then uh, three dynamics event, the acceleration event that uh, it will be just a straight acceleration and the skid pad, and then the, um, maybe most interesting, the endurance uh, in an unknown environment. So yeah, and oh, we are already in a competition in uh, 2018 from 11 to 15 July in Silverstone, UK. So uh, over 60 members in the Formula Student, KTH Formula Student teams, we are fi uh, 15 master students for the driverless, uh, we, s we work on it uh, almost on, a, on average of 20 hours per week and we came from many different backgrounds, robotics, machine learning, vehicle engineering and uh, mechatronics. And then I want to show you the, an overall table of our uh, system. In particular, we can start from the sensors and perception part. We are using right now a Velodyne uh, 3D LUT, uh, 3D lidars, and a stereo camera, an IMU uh, with a GPS embedded in it, and uh, wheel encoders uh, in each wheel of the car. Um, we are using uh, then a graph slam to as our typology of slam uh, that works in parallel with the sensor fusion and detection provided by the sensor. Then we have the planning algorithm, a uh, customized algorithm that we developed for this project, and then a trajectory generation and, and finally controls. And all this part is embedded in our own system. Then what it comes is the actuators and a space system, and it is real time, and uh, it controls for the actuators, uh, the real time system flows machine, and then the safety. We are also have other two uh, very important parts. One of course is the rules, uh, and standard compliance that is really important for this kind of applications. And then a quick si switch that uh, uh, will be uh, make it able us to change from a EV car to a DV car in a really uh, with a really small delay. This is really important for us because we want to be the first team to be able to compete in two categories, both EV and DV with the same car in the same competition. And we'll be, we'll be the first team in the history of uh, Formula Student. Then, I, I, there's a lot of videos and stuff that I would like to show you, but uh, we have to choose just one of these. And so what we chose is the cone detection that we developed uh, actually for our own. And uh, it's uh, Real-time cone detection for cones, of course, because the, the circuit will be uh, defined by cones. And as we can see, all the, all the yellow cones are now tracked with uh, fairly high precision and accuracy in real time. That would be really important for us. This is, of course, a video that is real-time, but with a driver, not, not driverless. Now the car is not really uh, finished yet. It will be finished for the competition. And, uh, but I also want to show you a video of uh, a completed car. This is our competitors <laughs> from uh, AMD Formula Student. And uh, our car will run in this way, hopefully even better. And <laughs>
And then one, the, the Islam completed the, and the, all the map, and we have a Google map of everything, the car to start on the next test. from the a minimum of 20 km per hour with a maximum of uh, 60 km. And it's a really big small truck, so after that, it's a So thanks you all and I also ask you to join us, both as students or companies or whatever. It's uh, really a thriving project and uh, we uh, have resources uh, to achieve our goals, but of course uh, we'll never got enough to achieve our ambitions. So thank you all. <laughs> For any questions? No questions. No questions. But, um, Pierre, you'll uh, stay around. If you have some questions, just uh, run over and uh, talk to Pierre. So that was it. Uh, the reason why I said no questions is just, you know, we're out of time. And uh, as you could tell, this is uh, what we uh, went through uh, today. Uh, you are the ones with the most stamina. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we're doing the uh, workshop next month. If you're interested, uh, I put on use the Stockholm hardware promo code. So just uh, make sure to use that to get the right pricing. In April, it's diversity. Oops, that's not it. That one. And thanks for coming. <laughs>